Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Sheets, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce David Lamfram to you today. David is the director of the California Desert and National Wildlife Programs. His career has offered him a diverse set of vantage points into our country's parklands. He's worked in the fields of uh, research biology, where he focused on aquaculture, agricultural biology, and herpetology, which is a study of reptiles and amphibians. After this, he spent three years as an environmental consultant working in his home state of Florida. He's authored a book on tortoises in the Mojave Desert and has leveraged his photography to help document and build awareness of the diverse wildlife which fills our parklands and deserts. Today, as the director of California Desert and the National Wildlife Programs, David has dedicated both his professional and personal lives to inspiring others to learn about and protect our wild lands, uh, which brings us to the topic for today, which is President Obama's recent designation of three new national monuments in the California desert. Uh, without for further ado, I'd like to introduce David. So I'm going to talk to you today about a couple of things. The first thing is I'm going to talk to you about deserts in general and why they matter. And I'm going to talk to you about one of the truly, I think, remarkable things that's happened in recent history, which is the designation of a vast swath of the beautiful California desert in perpetuity, connecting an incredibly large landscape together. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a story. So if everybody can see this lizard that's on the screen. This is a baby desert iguana. So most people don't know, or and some people wouldn't even care necessarily, that the state of California has its own iguana. So like a green iguana you would think of in Costa Rica, we have a desert adapted species of iguana. And I grew up in very urban South Florida. And basically, for my entire life, I was fascinated for, at least at the time, no good reason to the Mojave Desert. I was just fascinated. I wanted to know everything about that place. I wanted to know everything about the animals that lived there. And I was especially interested in the reptiles that lived there because they were just so fascinated. And they just did different things than animals in, the, in other places did. So for example, these lizards that live in the Mojave Desert, many of them are vegetarians. And a whole bunch of them actually when th there's a whole hierarchy of these lizards. And the smaller ones have adapted the, the ability to run on two legs to elude predators. And then the bigger lizards that chase those lizards run on two legs, kind of like a miniature Jurassic Park happening all across the California desert, which to me is, was so fascinating. But as I had the incredible privilege of living in the California desert, and, and becoming a wildlife photographer and getting to know the place. The thing I realized uh, about this desert is so often it exists in its fullness right before your eyes. And it's oftentimes extremely difficult to really see it. And it's a subtle place. And it's a place that's governed by incredibly long periods of time. And then spectacular, dramatic things happen. I, I was reminded of this. I was reminded of innovation. I was reminded of the diversity of the desert. When I was reviewing some of my photos and I looked at this photo, I was looking at this desert iguana. And for many, many years when I looked at this photo, I, I always thought, I always liked it. But I didn't, I didn't know exactly why. And it was a little strange. And I, I didn't really know why. But one day, I was really carefully looking at it. And even though I had studied the species for decades of my life, I learned something completely brand new that was right in front of me the whole time. I was looking at it, and I was looking. You guys, if everybody can see, does everybody see the eye of that lizard? And I looked at the eye really carefully. I realized that. That eye wasn't an eye at all. And in fact, the eye is above that eye. You see the slit? And I realized that without knowing it for all those years, looking at this photo of working with the species, that this lizard in the California desert had invented the first pair of sunglasses. 
And literally, the reason that this lizard has this particular pattern underneath its eye, it closes its eye, and you think about it, you live in an extreme environment, like a desert, that's incredibly arid, right? With intense heat, intense cold. Your eyes are sensitive, right? They're wet. And this lizard basically puts, pulls up the shades. And it does it in a way that predators would think that they were still being watched. We're lucky. We, we have an incredible national park system in the United States. And more, maybe more importantly, maybe just more to appreciate, is that that national park system has been the genesis of the creation of national parks across the world. When people think about our beautiful parks and think about this 100 years of protecting these remarkable places, people think of places like Grand Canyon, pictured here. It's an incredible chasm shaped by water and by ice. Or people think of Denali. Denali is a mountain that is so big and so vast that when you see it, I remember the first time I saw Denali, I was at a campground called Wonder Lake. And it's, it's a hell of a time to just get there. And when you get there, you stay there for a while. And I stayed there for a while. And I saw the mountain emerge. And it was the most amazing thing that I had ever seen. And then I realized I had only seen the bottom third of it. And when the rest of it unshrouded, I understood that I had never seen a mountain before. And I understood why people called Denali the Great One. And I think about these parks, these monuments to ice, to mountains, to rock, to vibrancy in life like Redwood. I think about the sequoias. I, th I think about the desert that I live in. And I think about the inherent balance the, in the universe where a giant mountain range bisects 14,000 foot peaks, run north to south, on one side, the greatest trees to, to ever live on the planet Earth because of the moisture that's dropped. On the other side, an incredible desert with the oldest living animals, plants on the planet. In addition to the remarkable places, the exposition, the geography that's protected by our national parks. And, and before I go on, let me just say that in talking about our national parks and talking about the history of our parks, it's not just the protection of natural landscapes, of, of our natural history that makes them special. What our national parks do, in fact, is they tell the story of America. And that story of America includes the story of our prehistory, of our geological history, of our natural history, of our evolutionary history, our biological history, but also telling some of the very difficult stories of America and of what it means to be American, some of the very difficult times that we've come through as a country, some of the terrible mistakes that we've made. I, for example, think about Manzanar. I think about the incarceration of American citizens in camps looking out across the Eastern Sierra to imagine being an American citizen. And because of your ethnicity, a war happens with the country that you come from. And you're forced then to live in a concentration camp. Our national parks also tell those stories. In addition to the protection of these great places and these great stories, there's also the protection of incredible life and life that may have otherwise not been protected. And I spend my spare time as a wildlife photographer, and I'd like to show you guys a few of those species that exist now because of the protection of our national parks. The additive value, the amplification. I met this particular grizzly bear in coastal Alaska, but the organization that I work for, the National Parks Conservation Association, is doing work to protect grizzly bears 
across the country. And I think about the bears that live in the lower 48, and without Yellowstone and Glacier National Park, there would be no grizzly bears left in the lower 48. So in addition to being sanctuaries of culture and sanctuaries of story, our national parks are also refugia, the last places for the last species, including some of the greatest extant living animals on our planet, like this incredible bear. I saw this bear take a salmon that was this big and eat it in two bites because he wanted to. <laughs> this is a musk ox. Musk ox is a species that's represented now. There, in the Pleistocene, there were four species of musk ox. So there's only one left. And I saw this one in Bering Land Bridge in Alaska, which is one of the last places that you can find this particular species. This is, I think, the species that people, the reason that people like this the most is because I think it reminds them of Star Wars. But for me, I like them because they have this incredible response. They have, so they, are always fearful of being eaten by polar bears or being eaten by wolves. And so they've developed this strategy, which is they put all their young in the middle of, of a circle, and they all circle up horns out to protect their young. I think about the natural processes that have happened that have evolved over time in North America. And maybe nothing is more powerful than the thought of the salmon run, where I think about it the nerdy biologist in me comes out all the time, but it's to think about these structures for bringing nutrients from the deep ocean back to land, that in the trees that you find along salmon streams, the protein actually builds forests. And to think about that distribution and redistribution of resources and how vital that is, and that those processes have developed over all time, and that we're lucky enough, at least in some places, to still have that, to enjoy that. This really cute hawk lives in Soberania National Park, which is in Panama. This particular hawk is exceedingly endangered. And people, you know, farmers look at it as a nuisance because it you know, eats, all, eats goats, just picks them up and takes them away. And in the, the, its natural prey source is usually monkeys. So this, Eagle, if you can believe it or not, it has short wings, lives in the high canopy, and it snatches monkeys out of trees, if you can believe that. And while it's a bad day for a monkey, and I think we can all agree that monkeys are cool, the protection of these great species is profound, and it makes life richer. It makes the content of the world we live in richer. I'll never forget the day that I met my first jaguar. And I saw, so these jaguars were hunting capybaras down by a river. And they were day hunting. Um, and so I was in a boat, and I was photographing one. And then I heard, don't worry, it wasn't a jackhammer. It was a capybara on a cliff. And it jumped off of a cliff into the river. And it screamed. And one second later, a really pissed off jaguar was at the top of the cliff, looking down. These things are still happening all over the world because of an American concept that was, been, that was exported that said, we want to tell the full stories of the world we live in. And now we're celebrating our 100th anniversary, and happy anniversary to you. This is a photo I took. And to me, it's the transition to the desert, because I found this tiny species in, an, in the Australian desert. And it's the ecological analog to our horned lizard. So it's thinking about how resources and places actually create species. You see a leopard and you see a jaguar. You see a green tree python and you see an emerald tree boa. You see a thorny devil and you see a horned lizard. 
the resources that are present actually create shapes in nature, like an incredible Play-Doh that the environment itself acts on the world to create the shapes. Many folks don't think about it, but roughly 30% of the lands on planet Earth are desert, and that the distribution of those deserts are very similar along lines of latitude. You see those lines going across? It goes through the majority of, right, 30 degrees north goes through the majority of deserts on the planet. And that's because of ocean, basically, currents and, and wind patterns, and where rain is brought and where it's not. But to think of, I think the desert is probably the most misunderstood and underappreciated landscape terrestrial biome on planet Earth. It's a place, I think, where people generally characterize it by what it isn't. It isn't a place with giant trees. It isn't a place with um, abundant rivers or greenery. But what it is is it's a place that has been acted on by these pressures and that these pressures have created spectacular innovation. Um, the type of innovation where, and I'll show you, things are happening that, on a global scale, that are even, sometimes difficult to comprehend, and things that we're still, I mean, as, as we think of, say, the rainforest and the medicine that lives there, and the species that live there, it's, we're still coming to understand why the desert matters and what a big role it plays on the planet. So, I don't think that I would have to convince anybody that the rainforest is one of the most important, it's the lungs of our planet, right? And that for us to live and be sustainably on this planet that we have to protect that rainforest. What if I told you that the rainforest exists in the way and shape it does because of the Sahara Desert? That's the case. So you can see this picture here from NASA, good folks over there at NASA. You can see here this satellite image of the winds coming off of the Sahara being blown across the Atlantic Ocean and landing in the Amazonian rainforest. And I guess the, fun, the question that you would ask yourself is, is why, why does that matter that the sand is being blown? or sand is being blown cool, what, what does that mean? Well, that sand, even though those, you know, the grains of sand might be a tenth of a millimeter, they contain phosphorus. And that phosphorus is actually used for the growth and health of the rainforest itself. There is a incredible interwoven tapestry of this entire planet. And again, we're just coming to, just to start to understand that. This is as nerdy as I'll get, and I promise that. But I just wanted to show you that in terms of the amount of species of any place on the planet, only tropical savannas have more species of animals than deserts do. And so what's known to science today is that there's something like almost 8,000 species, just animals, in the deserts of the world. And that that's more than tropical forests, that that's more than grasslands, than the temperate zones. And deserts are probably also the most understudied and underexplored places on the planet, right? Meaning that the opportunity to learn more and to find more, and for people who grew up like I did, wanting desperately to be an explorer, that that opportunity still exists in the world. If you want to be Indiana Jones, 
This is perhaps the most famous picture of a desert animal ever taken, this, this National Geographic photo by Chris Johns. And it shows the majesty of a black-maned lion fighting the kind of the elemental nature of the desert. It's these stark things. It's power versus power. Um, when you think about the desert, I think people, you know, we talked a lot about, say, reptiles, or we talked about, you know, other types of animals. But the reality is, is that if you think about deserts on this planet, the majority of mammals that you find in any type of ecosystem regularly live in the desert. So if you think of a tiger, there are tigers that live in Indian deserts. There are lions that live in deserts. The grizzly bears that lived in the, big, in the San Bernardino Mountains used to come down off of those mountains into the California desert. Elephants live in the desert. So while we have, an, I think we have a notion about the value of deserts, the reality is, is that life on this planet is, is well adapted to deserts. And that specialization has happened on a long-term and on a short-term basis. This is a picture of Death Valley National Park. And Death Valley National Park is, I think, well known as a land of extremes. But it's also one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. And it's a place where the raw geology of the planet is surfaced. There's not that many places where you can walk on a 2 billion year old rock. And there's not many places where you can find a plant, a tree that's 6,000 years old, or a bush, a humble bush that's four feet tall that had been around since the Egyptians were doing some stuff that isn't happening right now. When I talk about the California desert, and I want to give you guys the context of this landscape. The California desert is a remarkably large. It's about a fifth of the state of California. And it's roughly the size of Virginia. Um, also, if you look at the green dots in here, those are three of the now four national parks that exist within the California desert. It's a land with, I think, it's characteristically, I think when people think of the California desert, they think of sand dunes. I think people think of, really when people are thinking of the California desert, they're actually thinking of the Sahara and what they've seen on TV. But in fact, the California desert is an incredibly rocky place. And it's a place with huge mountain ranges and ra mountain range after mountain range after mountain range. It's a place where uh, in the 1800s, folks tried to introduce camels but the camels couldn't make it because it was too rocky. It's that kind of landscape. It's, a, it's just an endless basin and range geology with incredibly diverse range of life. This photo here, if you look at the various colors that exist, this is an area that goes from almost LA up to Utah. And it shows the Mojave Desert, and it shows in these various colors all the lands that are protected within that landscape. California Desert is, in fact, the most protected landscape in the lower 48. It's a big landscape. It's in incredible condition. I'll show you. As you get more towards the color green, you can see this is basically showing what's kind of pr left that's pristine in the country. And when you look at where the greatest concentration of dark and light green converge, that happens in the California desert stretching into central Nevada. There are some other really well-protected areas in the country. But nothing to that extent and nothing where you could draw a line 700 miles or 800 miles and have a contiguous landscape like that. And a contiguous landscape like that means a lot of things. It means that species that migrate are able to still migrate as they have for thousands of years, that the anthropogenic change has not been intense on that landscape. And for our California desert, that's really happened 
recently it's happened due to, to really good planning. But for so long before that, it was really that people hadn't found a use for it. And when you think of our desert, our California desert, and you compare it to deserts across the world, our California desert is in the best shape of any desert on the planet. And it's one of the most protected and connected landscapes on planet Earth. And I think when people would think about that, they would think about the Congo or the Amazon. They wouldn't necessarily think of the California desert. But industrial activities have really only taken place in the California desert for less than 100 years. And real industrialization has probably only really taken place for about 50 years. So we're talking about, as we talk about the conservation of this landscape, which is the effort to which I spend my full life to understand and protect this desert, that maybe this is a different kind of story. Maybe this isn't the story of what would it have been like if we had only gotten here at this time. In this place, we, I think we're making decisions today. And we're making decisions every day about what the future of this landscape is going to look like. And there's been a tremendous amount of positive momentum and action that's taken place. There are, right now, and I'll show you, I'll show you some maps, but there's roughly 10 million acres of contiguous protection that exists in the California desert, making it the second largest protected desert reserve on the planet in our beautiful California desert. The desert is humbling. The desert is also a place where many people go to find spirit. It's a difficult place, certainly in summer. And it is like the Arctic in many ways, where there are long stretches of harshness and then incredible short, ephemeral times of bounty, where in the Arctic, everything becomes blueberries or salmon run upstreams. Or in the California desert, where a, a once a, you walk, uh, you, you do a hike, and the hike goes through kind of a beautiful, rugged, elemental brown country. And you do that hike again after a wet spring, and the entire world is flowers. I was. This year, we had, a remarkable, we had a remarkable spring. We had a remarkable bloom in Death Valley. And it had a different type of composition than any I had ever seen. And one of those things was called verbena. And verbena is a small, beautiful purple flower. And verbena has this wonderful smell. And uh, I was camping on a dry lake bed, because that's just something you do in the desert. And there were these guys who were basically using these propelled, self-propelled, I don't know exactly what you call them, but they were basically personal helicopters, where you get a running start, you turn, the, you turn the motor on, and that's why they were on the dry lake bed. And you get up in the air, and they were way up in the air. And when the guy came down, he looked like he was lost. And I was like, hey, are you all right? Do you need water? And he said, I just had a spiritual experience. I was up about 2,000 feet above that large mountain range. It was a, a mountain range called the Kingston Mountains. That's a 7,000 foot tall mountain. And he was flying over it. And on one side of it is an entire sand dune complex that was completely covered. So the whole sand dunes was covered in this purple flower, this verbena. And he said, as I flew over the mountain, all I could smell was verbena. And it had never occurred to me. Where do those oils go? They're carried in the wind. Where are they carried? Where are those seeds carried to? They're carried all across that desert. There's just so much to learn. And there's so much, I think, the, the, the contrast in the desert of the harshness and the fragility is profound, artistic, spiritual, whatever you want to call it. It's poignant. I arrived in the California desert in 2008, 
And in 2008, um, shortly thereafter, myself, my colleagues, my co the coalition of folks that I work with started on an effort to protect the greatest connected landscape in the lower 48. And you can see here on these colors, basically the, the light green are the national park lands. And just north of where it says Fort Irwin, just north of that, Death Valley National Park connects north to from Mojave National Preserve. This is an incredibly large landscape we're talking about, you know, going from you know, almost, we're talking about 50 miles to the border all the way up to Bishop, California. That's how far north and south we're talking about. We started it, an effort that was community focused but also political to take wild places that really, really needed protection and to start sharing that with folks and working to get people to understand why these places mattered and what could be done about it. And I'm so glad to be able to be here to, to, with the good news to let you guys know that after nearly a decade of work, so much effort, strife, discussions, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours, we were able to get to a point where we were not unable to pass legislation. We had a bill to protect these lands. We couldn't get Congress to do the right thing. And we asked the president if he would do the right thing. And in February, he did. And he designated 1.8 million acres. And this map here shows those lands. And those lands will be protected forever. And I'm going to walk you through these different monuments so you can get to know them. They're better in person. Unless you get me in advance, I'm probably not going to be able to narrate them for you while you're there. You guys hate jokes. So the gray, the, kind of the gray down at the bottom, that's Sand and Snow National Monument. I want to walk you through that a little bit. This is an aerial photo of Sand and Snow National Monument. And it's special for a lot of reasons. And the name is literal, because it stretches from 1,500 feet sand up to 10,000 feet in snow. And as the national monuments go, this one is the most diverse in terms of the um, life zones that it goes through. It goes through six different life zones. And then you can imagine what that's like going from, you actually go from the Sonoran Desert to the Mojave Desert, because that's where the deserts come together. And the Mojave Desert is a, a higher, colder desert. Then you start moving up into Aspen, you start moving up into fir, yellow pine. You almost get to tree line in this national monument. You can see in the very background San Gorgonio, the highest point in Southern California, which is part of that national monument. The foreground are the little San Bernardino Mountains. And the little San Bernardino Mountains are kind of the mountainous shield that mark the transition from the Coachella Valley, where Palm Springs is, up to Joshua Tree National Park. These are Ocotillos, which are found in the lower Sonoran Desert, the kind of the very bottom. So sand to snow is really important for wildlife and for wildlife migrations. There's a, a really a place in this national monument that's a, really special to me. It's called Big Morongo Canyon. And Big Morongo Canyon is one of the most important places for birds in the entire state of California. And if you could imagine being a bird and flying over harsh desert, and you see an oasis of cottonwood trees, standing water, palms, this is where hundreds of bird species come to nest in this basically pocket, a pocket of water that's created a forest because the geology just, there's a fault, water, there's an underground river. The fault hits that water source, pushes it upwards. Life, just add water. It's also a really, really important place because for folks who spend time in the Sierra, as folks who spend time in Sierra know, the California mountains get increasingly dry 
as the year goes on. So there, there's snow melt and there's a abundance, there's waterfalls in spring. As you get into fall, everything starts drying up and you start getting wild, wildfire danger and everything almost gets crispy. And at those times, those perennial water sources become even more important. So if you, you might be at Big Morongo Canyon and it wouldn't be uncommon to see a black bear down at 2,000 feet in the middle of the desert, you know, just in this grove in the middle of the desert, you might be on a boardwalk and there could be a black bear on it, or mountain lions, or bighorn sheep. The, this is the cactus wren, which has one of the most beautiful songs of any birds, um, and which is characteristic of the Mojave portion of sand to snow. And many people don't know that California desert is actually a really wonderful place to see, to see fall color. And in, along the river bottoms and the places where you get especially cottonwood, you get outstanding fall color. Second place I'm gonna to talk to you about is Mojave Trails National Monument. And that's this big white component. It stretches all the way down to Joshua Tree National Park and up to Mojave National Preserve. For, for context, Mojave National Preserve is 1.6 million acres. It's the third largest national park unit in the lower 48. Mojave Trails, which is now connected to it, is also 1.6 million acres, connecting down to Joshua Tree National Park, which is 800,000 acres. This is an aerial photograph where it's incredible to fly over the Mojave because you have the opportunity to really see the geological forces at work. You'll see huge volcanic fields and you'll see dry lake beds with that where in the Pleistocene were home to Native American villages and to mammoths alike. And you see oceans of sand slowly taking over the land. And when you're flying over, you'll see these mountain ranges and they almost, as you get high enough, they almost look like caterpillars walking across the landscape. Here you can see that the sand is actually covering the mountains. And there's a bunch of places where the mountain ranges are actually buried in so much sand that all you can see is the little, kind of the crest of the peaks. And that, those crests are like islands in the sand. And you think about that on a geological level, you think about how much sand that is and how many years that is and how remarkable that is that there are mountain ranges completely covered in sand across the California desert. Mojave Trails National, Monu National Monument is a place where you get that kind of feeling. This is one of the lower mountain ranges and I'm just showing you this because the lightest color rock is actually an old fossil bed um, from, the, from the Carboniferous period where people actually go to find trilobites. So people will go at, with their pickaxes and they'll pull out these ancient sea creatures from 350 million years ago that are probably seeing the light. I mean, they're not seeing it, obviously, but they're seeing the light for the first time in a really long time. The protection of Mojave Trails also protects almost a million acres of critical desert tortoise habitat, which is so important because, number one, it's super cool that we have a desert tortoise, right? That in America, we have four species of tortoises. Now, one of those lives in California, that it's our state reptile, and that it's an interesting and cool species, but that to know that in the last 20 plus years that we've probably lost 90% of them, and then to know that we've protected over, over a million additional acres of their habitat is extremely important for the perseverance of the species. It's just an important place for large mammals, for mountain lions, for coyotes, um, for bighorn sheep, for mule deer. They walk across these, these grand landscapes and they don't really have a, you know, a species that lives in a place with abundant resources might not have to cover the same amount of ground as a species in the desert does. So to protect the larger landscapes and the really important water sources is crucial to the well-being of these, of these creatures. And throughout the Mojave, we have these underground river systems, like here is the Mojave River, 
which comes down from the San Bernardino Mountains and ends at Mojave National Preserve. This is, this is Amboy Crater, one of the youngest lava fields in the California desert. It's home to an incredible diversity of species and it's actually a laboratory, an ecological laboratory because the species that live here all exhibit melanism, which means that they're darker. So you, species that you'll find that'll be various colors, when you find them in the lava, they've adapted to that environment and they've done that really quickly. And scientists from all over the world are coming to this particular place to figure out how they've adapted so quickly. That's the chuckwalla. It's a two foot long vegetarian lizard. They're really social and they don't get bitey aggressive, but they get very territorial. And when they get into breeding, they'll come right up to you um, and let you know that you should not mess with their females. The final monument that I want to talk to you about, and I'm going to stop very soon because I want to make sure that we have time for questions, is this black piece in Mojave National Preserve, it's Castle Mountains National Monument. This is our newest National Park Service unit. This is the National Park Service website for the unit, just created this year. And this is some original art that NPCA produced to celebrate and commemorate the designation of this remarkable landscape. Let me tell you why it's special. At about 5,000 feet in the very eastern Mojave Desert, you get monsoonal rain, which makes it incredibly lush and high enough elevation that you actually create an extremely rare thing in the California desert. That's a grassland. So this is an actual grassland that is kind of hugged between two of the most iconic mountain ranges, in the entire California desert. Because it's a grassland and because of its elevation and, be, and because of the amount of moisture it gets, it's super diverse and you get all kinds of things happening here that aren't happening in other places. The Joshua trees, so this is the termination, the eastern termination of the world's largest Joshua tree forest. And those Joshua trees are riddled with life. There are all kinds of animals using them, including red-tailed hawks, which nest in them. And we were out here recently on a tour and there were baby red-tailed hawks that were just learning to fly. And we were able to see these hawks doing a really terrible job of flying, but in a ridiculous and wonderful way, where they're flapping around, they're hanging upside down, and we were there as the sun was setting, and so we're watching the silhouette of the hawks as they're flapping around. It's remarkable. Here's a good look at the extent of the grassland. This is the most intact grassland left in the California desert and was severely threatened and thankfully has just now been protected just this February. There are two herds of bighorn sheep that live here. A migratory herd that goes around a large set of mountains and then another one that stays the entire year in the Castle Mountains. This is a good look at the Castle Peaks. They're volcanic in origin and a really good look at the diverse, the Joshua Tree Forest, as well as the different species of yucca that live here. Some of those yuccas may be a thousand years old. The final goal that we have for this landscape for the Castle Mountains is the reintroduction of the pronghorn antelope. So 100 years ago, on this grassland there were pronghorn antelope and there were Mexican wolves that would hunt them. And our first step is to reintroduce these pronghorn antelope and it's something that we've wanted to do for a very long time but we're unwilling to do because we didn't know what the fate of the landscape was gonna be. But now that it's protected, it's our next step. I'm gonna end it here just so we have time for questions but thank you guys so much for listening to me talk about the California desert. One question I would have for you is if you could explain to us some of the difference between the designation of a national monument versus a national park and some of the other possibilities the government had with these lands. That would be awesome. So I think everybody knows that government is simple. 
the, there's so many different agencies in the California desert that manage land. So there's different within, the, there's an, a, the interior department and that within that interior department, there's the Bureau of Land Management, which is the largest landowner in the entire country. And they manage for a specific purpose, which is called multiple use, which means that they protect some lands. Some lands are designated for protection. Some lands are designated for recreation, et cetera. Um, the National Park Service has less lands, although they have a great deal of lands in the California desert. The National Park Service has a more conservation-focused mission, and that mission is to protect those resources that exist there in perpetuity. There are other land managers that are not in the Department of Interior, like the Forest Service, for example, which is in the Department of Agriculture. But, and there's also Department of Defense, which owns something like three million acres of land in the California desert. So there's a, a lot of different types of designations. What the National Monuments that I discussed, Sand of Snow and Mojave Trails, those are both owned by the Bureau of Land Management and they are being protected for the protection of their resources. Castle Mountains is owned by the National Park Service and is gonna be protected in perpetuity for the protection of its resources. So in both cases, they have extremely high levels of protection. And I was wondering how you think about the future of um, having people being able to camp in these preserves and in these national parks, but also making sure that like they aren't destroying them at the same time and what you think like tourism in that sense will be like as we go on? I mean, I think that's a really important question and it's a tough thing for, I think that it's really easy to look at it in this binary way where the amount of people who use something directly correlates to the intensity to which it is harmed. I don't think that that's necessarily the case, and I think in many cases, the more a person steps foot on a place, the softer their foot becomes because they, bec they come to care about it. They come to understand it. And so I don't think that it's really about the specific use. I think it's about people being open to understanding what a place is and why it matters and who it's for and that, that the answer to who it's for is for everybody and that that matters. And it's hard sometimes to have the perspective of time to think about who came before and who will come after. But I think it's a humble and, and important thing for us to think about. And I think that ultimately we have to show people and we don't, it, and not in a judgy way or not in a restrictive necessarily way but just about being, I think that there's nothing more compelling to me than people who love things. And so if we have genuine stewards in places who care about places, I think we will have those places. Um, and maybe what you have observed and what you are observing um, currently and maybe what would be your hopes for the future and kind of like um, the two sides of it, um, like how technology gets to separate people from nature and as you said like what uh, we don't directly know and uh, and the thing that we don't directly directly engage with uh, it's like uh, maybe we we don't really feel the need to protect right and on the other side how technology um, may help to uh, completely the opposite like reestablish uh, that connection I mean, I think that's a really wonderful question. And I think there's a lot of answers. And there's a lot of ways that we could discuss this. But there's a couple of, I think, just really immediate points. So one is, it's an, it's an incredibly privileged position to have the earth sustain you, to have food, to have water, to have everything you need, and then to say, I don't need nature. I mean, it's a a very privileged place to be. Um, and I don't think it's about, I don't think it's about people having to reconnect to nature or that people have disassociated from nature. I think it's that it's that continuum that I was discussing before, which is if you think, if we all think back 
you know, and some of us don't even have the privilege of knowing. Like, I don't know. I can't go that far back in my own, in my own family tree and know exactly what my distant relatives did. I have no idea. But a couple generations ago, we were all fundamentally connected to the land. And understanding who we are and where we came from is a function of understanding that we came from the land. And it's not about, I think, it's not about certain Good Samaritans showing folks, you know, hey, let me show you how to be outside. Let me take you hiking. Let me teach you how to camp. It's about people understanding themselves and where they come from. And I don't think every person has to be an environmentalist, or maybe every person doesn't even enjoy being outside. But I think that you have to understand that you're on this planet, and you have to understand your place on it, and that you have a profound privilege, that we, as, we at least have this incredible privilege, and that part of that is being respectful of that world. Now, when you think about and talk about people who are being disconnected from, you know, due to, due to technology. So, you know, I, I just think that because people, I think people inherently care about nature. I mean, people, cat videos, animals, right? People are drawn instinctually, inherently to living creatures on the earth and to the earth itself. And when people think about themselves in beautiful places, they think about these places. It's a deep part of our ethos. So we are connected. And so if I thought about the lines of disconnection, I don't think that they're really that far apart. And I frankly think that technology can, you know, if we're open to it. I think it's just about us being humbled. But I think if we're open to it, technology can help us enjoy. I just saw today there's an app, a Shazam for plants, where you take a picture of a plant, right? And your phone is going to tell you what that plant is. I, just bec because I still use a typewriter, I wasn't the guy to invent that. But I think that's awesome. Um, it's, easy to, it's easy to assume that we are very far, but we're not. We are here. We are a part of this thing that's happening. And I think that really is just people have to just take a moment. I think if you just really calmly think about yourself and your place on this earth, you understand that you're connected to all of these systems, right? We're, we are plugged into the natural world in way more ways than we're plugged into the internet or our phones or any of these things. Are, are there similar efforts to protect these deserts in the other states in the West, in Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, as you described in California? There are, there are multiple and discrete efforts across the West in deserts and in mountains to protect really, really precious places. I don't think that there's anything, there, there is, I think, something of this scale that's being thought about in the state of Utah right now. Beyond that, I don't think that there's anything of this magnitude that has been envisioned. And, I, and for me, what's really remarkable is that, that we got there, that we, were, we had the foresight to protect such a wide, kind of wild and vast land. Um, but. There are efforts. Efforts are ongoing. But the, but the reality is, is there's more to do. There's, there's a tremendous amount of really, really special places. But for these efforts to actually work, they have to be authentic. And they have to be driven by people who know the places and love the places. So I don't think that con conservation should not, that's not the right word. Conservation for its own sake has value, but it's best when done by people who love places to care for those places. Otherwise, if you're, it's not, otherwise it becomes politics or a game. And that may take us farther away from where we want to be, which is to really help people understand these places and why they matter. Thank you so much, David. Really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. <laughs>